So please state your full name. Uh, my name is Jonathan Philip Peck. And your age? Please. 56. And where were you born? I was born here in Montreal, 1960. And um, when you were a child, what did your parents do? My parents were both teachers. Uh, elementary school on my mother's side and uh, college and uh, university and ultimately came, coming back to high school on my father's side. So language specialist. Okay. So. And what were your interests as a child, your pastimes? Uh, varied. Uh, they uh, moved from all uh, different uh, types of careers to uh, uh, again to the one that I'm in currently which I never anticipated actually when I was a kid so um, that only came later in life. Okay. So. And uh, how about at school? Um, what, what would you consider to be your strengths as a kid and going into high school? Uh, torturing uh, my teachers uh, was one of the, my strengths. Um, I, I would think that I was an average student, but uh, reasonably consistent in terms of uh, grades and interests uh, across the board. I didn't really have any one topic that I was you know, particularly interested in. Sciences and math, maybe, but uh, really had my calling towards that end in science and engineering was mainly when I hit the college level. It wasn't uh, prior to that. Okay. So. So so what um, if you I guess didn't have specific interests uh, until college? How how did you know what to get into? Once you went I tried college? a variety of different things. I went through the sea ship system here in in Quebec, and uh, I didn't finish the uh, the deck or the the degree from sea ship. I went to John Abbott College. But I ended up going to Ontario uh, after three semesters of, at CGEP. I uh, ended up in uh, mechanical engineering at University of Ottawa. And uh, that inspired me to go down one direction, but then I decided that wasn't enough. Uh, and I came back to Concordia, um, mainly because I wanted to be a civil engineer at the time. And uh, from civil engineering, I discovered geology. From geology, I went into geology. And from geology, I went into mining. That's kind of the route that happened, but that was again late in my career. I was twenty twenty two at the time. Okay. So. And what uh, what ended up attracting you to mining? What what's appealing to you? The the practical aspects of mining. Um, the fact that it's working with your hands. It's working with a, a variety of different uh, knowledge uh, uh, that uh, traditional engineering uh, doesn't really need. It's a jack of all trades, really. And so it combined mechanical engineering with the civil engineering with geology, and it put it all into one job. Plus, it was outdoors. It was in an interesting area, big equipment, open pit mines. That's really what attracted me. And uh, so what was your degree when you completed? I completed the, uh, my first degree was in, uh, was in geology, geological sciences, Concordia, uh, 84. And uh, from there, I already had quite a bit of background in terms of an engineering, engineering degree. And I carried that forward to McGill, where I was then able to uh, get into the Master's of Engineering program. And it was inspired through uh, a prof there that, in fact, uh, we've talked about in the past, Malcolm Scoble. So he was the one that drew me out of the uh, geology program into, uh, into mining. So Because I was at McGill actually doing a Master's in ge Geological Sciences as well, Geotech Engineering when Malcolm pulled me across. Okay. So. And what was your thesis or most prominent work? Well, the thesis I started on, it was related to automation to some extent, but it was monitoring uh, machines, looking at large blast hole drills. And uh, that's the work that attracted me. So Malcolm had a project that was funded by Natural Science and Engineering Research Council. It was a collaborative research development project with uh, Ford and Cole at the time. This was about eight, 1987. And so that became the the uh, core of my thesis as a result, but it was that that inspired me in, and that was the the basis for me staying within mining, doing a master's degree, and then finally my PhD. So that was it. So, okay. and what would you consider to be your first official job uh, within the, the mining? Um, after I graduated, '89, uh, I uh, took on the responsibilities primarily at an academic uh, uh, perspective. I was uh, running an automation and robotics lab at McGill, um, which was joint with uh, Ecole Polytechnique uh, called CCARM, CCARM, Canadian Centre for Automation and Robotics. And uh, it was, they had, there was a director there, a fellow named Andre Pichet, who was ex-Naranda uh, Research, who was running the group uh, at the uh, executive level, and I was the McGill laboratory manager. And uh, so that was my first job after graduating with my PhD, and stayed there until the funding uh, ran out in 1992. So, and and how was um, back in so late eighties, early nineties? How did r robotics look or, or mining automation 
early stages. Yeah. In fact, CCARM was uh, one of the first centers in the world to uh, look at this whole aspect of applying automation of robotics to mining. But in 89 through 92, it was pretty early stages for it. Um, there was a prof that was brought across to uh, uh, run that center eventually, a fellow named John Edwards, who came from uh, uh, the UK, where he had been working for the National Coal Board and uh, doing quite a bit of work in terms of large machine automation. And so he was brought across to be the expert to port that expertise into mining here in Canada. But it was very early stages. The machines were still heavily geared around manned operation. The technology wasn't ready for, for prime time. Um, it was really uh, early stages. This is, you know, again, 89 to 92 before um, really there was a, you know, a lot of different uh, technologies around, including smartphones or anything else like that. It was very, um, you know, again, uh, very little on the market that you could, uh, you could work with. You had to build everything from scratch. So, so uh, from there, maybe take me kind of quickly through your career and we'll, sure. uh, maybe I'll stop you afterwards. So after uh, CCARM in 92, uh, again, with drying up of the funding, um, the whole group was let go because there was no further um, opportunities to fund it through McGill. Um, federal government, provincial government funds were gone. I uh, basically closed the group down in 92, around uh, June of that year. I took the whole team outside and at that point incorporated Aquila Mining Systems, which was the company that I ran for uh, for many years. So it was the, the embodiment of all the technology that we developed within CCARM. We kind of pulled it through that company and chose the ones that had the most merit in terms of actual products that the industry was looking for. And you have examples of, uh, I guess, your, your best products? Well, the, the monitoring, I mean, we proved to the, in, to the world, uh, I would think, that we uh, could create ruggedized industrial level computer platforms that would actually survive on mobile mining equipment. Uh, starting with uh, blast hole drills, uh, we, we did our first project with New Brunswick Coal in 1993. That was the first purchase order that I got through Aquila. Um, so it was, uh, again, early stages, but we built uh, an adapted uh, industrial level on, a, on a, an assembly line to uh, use uh, in mobile uh, mining machine applications. And uh, we could see that there was just an incredible amount of uh, interest in that sort of level of product. So we decided to expand upon it and we took it to the next level with, uh, from monitoring to high precision GPS adaptation. And everything is a question of timing because around 93, 94, uh, GPS receivers were coming down in size, they were becoming more robust, they were becoming faster in terms of update rates and accuracy, and we just found that the confluence of our product demand was, was right at the right time with respect to these uh, GPS receivers. So by 94, we had a GPS guidance solution, not only for drills, but also for electric cable shuttles. And uh, that was the beginning of the product line that uh, we developed with Aquila. So. You can continue and then... <laughs> so in 90, 94, 94 was the first uh, commercial version of a high-precision GPS system for blast hole drills. Uh, we, we worked in concert, as we've always done. We've always had a partnership with the mining industry in Canada. And we found support of people within New Brunswick Coal, a fellow named Andy Cormier, who was the, uh, the CEO of the company in 93, who funded us and believed in us. And we deployed a, a solution that met his specific needs for New Brunswick Coal. And uh, another uh, big sponsor of ours was Fording Coal, and particular people like uh, Don Shylock and also Jim Popovich, uh, who at the time was the CEO of uh, Fording Coal. And they believed in technology and they wanted to see it adapted and they could see the, the, the avenues for where it would make a big difference within mining. And uh, again, through their support and funding, uh, 93, 94, they were really the reasons why we got into the GPS guidance market. I've proven that it would work, but we didn't quite have the, uh, the financing to, to support it. But they, uh, they gave us uh, a bridging loan of half a million dollars with the, uh, the opportunity for us to return that in terms of royalty payments to them. Although they didn't believe it at the time that they'd ever see a dime back, they didn't see the, all their money back and more, more than that. Um, so it worked out well, and it was that partnership uh, that uh, allowed those products to be, again, uh, made correctly in terms of meeting customer needs and being able to be deployed correctly such that the client could use it and support it properly. And that was, again, that's always been our mantra in terms of doing these products. And how, um, were you guys among the first to, to develop this? We, we were the first in. 
There had been no um, nobody since that time, or at that particular time in in the history, that had ever looked at the synthesis between onboard monitoring and the use of high precision GPS. Caterpillar, in fact, was at that time playing with some of those components in the 94, 95 time frame. Uh, but uh, we can honestly say that we were one of the first ones out with a, uh, a unit on blast hole drills and also one on, uh, on cable shovels. And so, uh, again, there were people looking at and recognizing where these new technologies, these new enabling technologies like GPS could be utilized, but we were, we were the first one to really put a commercial product out there. So, and For someone who uh, is listening to this and, and doesn't necessarily know much about mining and how that works, uh, how is a GPS system important and how is that applied? Well, everything's about accuracy. I mean, mining is, is really looking at a three-dimensional you know, image of what's in the ground, again, which is defined through your initial program of exploring. So going in and trying to define what the, what the ore body or the resource is. And then once you have that plan in, in a three-dimensional model is how do you then go after each piece of it and take the various slices off accurately because, of course, it comes back to how much ore you take versus the waste material. And so GPS allows you to stay closer to that plan of how you go after and extract the, uh, the ore body uh, by having you know, the capabilities of plus or minus five centimeters accuracy in three dimensions. It allows you to be very detailed and very accurate with respect to going after that ore body. And every little you know, uh, improvement in accuracy means millions of dollars. And so that's, re that's really what GPS is all about. And your other, the automation systems must have been also helped with safety. Well, automation comes into play because, again, like anything else, mining is a dangerous, you know, or can be a dangerous uh, industry to work in. Uh, big machines with uh, high voltage uh, on board, high uh, hydraulic pressures, uh, you know, dust and noise and everything else. Could you take the operator away from that uh, hazard zone? And the answer is you can. And the key is, is to having some technologies that will allow you to do that. One of them is automation, whether it's automation while you're drilling the hole or while you're operating the machine, which again, it's still at this point in time today, some of that is still in its infancies. But the fact is we try to do certain parts of the drilling process that would be conducive to automation, such as when the operator needs to drill a hole from one position to another in an uh, elevation. And so we automated that process. And uh, subsequent to that, and where we are today is trying to automate the whole process so you can get the operator fully off the machine. Right. But okay. It was just a stage in that whole, that whole automation sequence. Okay. Did you, um, with, with the whole automation system, did you, uh, you said you were, worked with CAT? Yes. With CAT? Well, um, yeah, 90, 96, uh, we, uh, well, 95, I'll go back up a bit. 95 is when we um, started talking to Trimble Navigation. Uh, at the time, they were one of the the um, the key players in the uh, high precision GPS market today they're, a, they're the dominant player, but they came and approached this because they had a problem. They had a client in South Africa that was looking for a high precision GPS system for drills. They didn't have the capacity to deliver one, and they came to us to partner on that uh, particular project. As a result of that, they uh, purchased a uh, minority interest in us um, in Aquila Mining Systems, and at the time we didn't know it, but they were also partnering with Caterpillar. And as a result of Trimble taking an investment in us, Caterpillar subsequently came after us in 96, and they bought a majority stake in us in September of 96. And so that's how we forged the partnership with Caterpillar and became part of that organization, at least the, from the point of view of the, the mining technology side. So. And in retrospect, you'd say that's a, that was a good thing? It was a good thing. It was a great thing. I mean, if we hadn't joined with Caterpillar, uh, we would have been competing with them. Um, so better to work with the uh, large U.S. companies than to uh, try to fight them. Uh, I think together with Caterpillar, we did some amazing things. And we, we put our minds together and we put uh, you know, uh, our best foot forward to come up with uh, products that today are considered the industry standard. And uh, for, from my perspective, that's probably the biggest legacy we have. We pushed the envelope. We delivered these products that were fairly innovative at the time, and basically, you know, nobody's caught up to to that product today. It is the standard by which every other product out there is is uh, compared, which is a a very nice thing to have. So, and we did it with Caterpillar and Trimble. So, did the um, did the automation systems make it to the um, 
oil sands. I know now they're going to be with the like 400 ton trucks and things like that. They, they did, but we didn't have much of a direction with respect to um, the autonomous haul truck programs, which are really where things are at today. Uh, if you look at autonomous haul trucks, they started back in 96. They probably started a little bit before that with Caterpillar. 1995 is a research project within them. But we weren't involved in that. We, we stuck to blast oil drills and cable shovels with Caterpillar. That was the main focus. Um, but many of the technologies that came out as a, as a result of the developments that we did are affiliated or associated with the autonomous haul trucks today. So it's, again, it all builds up towards uh, higher levels of automation eventually. And I think we, we may not have had anything direct to do with autonomous haul trucks back when, but certainly indirectly, some of the technologies we did use will feed question. into it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, after CAT, so Akil has been, been purchased by CAT. Yep. Uh, what what next? What happened? So we '96 Caterpillar bought a majority stake, and uh, I had uh, I remained the CEO of uh, Aquila Mining Systems. So we grew. We grew substantially larger than we you know we, we were at the time of the acquisition. Always based yeah. out of Montreal, by the way? Always based out of Montreal. Yeah, we were based uh, downtown Montreal, um, you know, right, right in, in center town. And uh, the company grew to a fair size, uh, probably at maximum uh, size we were 50, 52 people. And so we were a significant uh, player in the industry and we were one of the few at the time. I mean, as I say, we had a, a gap of many years where we were the only one in that marketplace. And there were others that were competing with us, but they were you know, far behind, and uh, so we had really had a, a dominant position. But the industry, through its fluctuations, going up and down, uh, from '96, '96 was a down year. Uh, 2000 was a down year. It was a struggle for those four years, uh, just trying to get out there. The products were not cheap; they were new. Uh, people were a little bit skeptical. The industry in general is always a little hesitant about changing their ways, and so we had to fight those uh, those uh, hurdles as well to get the products accepted. And so we spent. Uh, four to five years really pushing the envelope in terms of getting the, the technologies adopted and accepted and, and proven out. Uh, but it was, it was a tough time. And through to, into 2002, um, I stayed on as CEO and then I decided that it was time for the whole, uh, the whole change uh, to, to occur. And I left the company, or at least left my position as CEO and became a, a, a different, uh, or played a different role within Caterpillar for the next two years, till about 2004. So, Which was, what was the role? Uh, the role was new product introduction and uh, development manager for the, for the complete product line. So beyond just the Aquila stuff, I went on to do more, more technologies as well. Mindstar was one of them, the fleet management system. And, uh, you know, Cat's own products were under that umbrella. So I did that for, for two years. That's and been inter interesting, the things you... Interesting and frustrating. Yeah. You know, again, working with a large U.S. company was a, a different story, and it was no longer my, my game because Caterpillar ha owned 100% of the company then. And so it was really dictated by their process and by their people and, and so on. And like any big company, there's uh, strengths and weaknesses of it. So, and, uh, so I stayed on until 2004, and 2004 I decided that was it. And uh, I think we, uh, we agreed to part ways uh, you know, amicably, but uh, it was time to leave. Okay. And so 2004 was when I formed my new company, PECDEC, the one I'm in now. So Where we are filming uh, currently. Correct. In, in uh, Rio Montreal. Yep. So could you talk a bit about TechPEC? Uh, what is TechPEC? Uh, how did it yep. start? Well, Pe PECDEC started as a result of uh, you know, the experience that I had built up through Caterpillar and Aquila and having worked in the industry for, you know, for many years up to that point. And uh, our role that I saw, I didn't want to get back into product development. I wanted to um, um, basically help clients identify their technology needs and then help them go out and find the right solutions. Find in the sense that we wouldn't build something, we would go and buy it off the shelf and uh, help them integrate it. In other words, help them buy it, help them integrate it, help them deploy it, help them support it. So given that most clients were still unaware of most of the technology needs, and uh, again, su you know, suppliers tend to sell things in a, in a manner that convinces you they have all the answers, but the question you know, that still remains is there's many gaps within what they offer and what the client actually needs. So our role was to come in and help the client do a better job of bridging to the supplier and making sure that he got the right solution deployed in his operation. So we sat mainly on the customer side. 
And through the course of four years, we decided that uh, finally in 2007 that we could identify a lot of areas where we, as product development people, could become engaged. And so we saw opportunities jump into the market again. And in 2007, I decided to do that. We got involved in some product development work with a particular client, Western Canada, and that was the beginning of uh, where we are today, where we're actually a company of consulting services and also product development and product sales. And so we diversified in 2007 to enable that to occur. I just couldn't resist uh, you know, staying out of the industry again. So, so since that time, we've done a number of projects to develop some uh, reasonably uh, innovative solutions, and uh, we continue to do so at this present time, um, which also includes having a, a renewed partnership with our, our friends at Caterpillar as of uh, 2015. So, okay. so it's all good. Good. Uh, what are the, actually first question, if you had to give a percentage of consulting versus uh, product development, what would you say? Probably, you probably equally divided now. If you'd asked me this about a year and a half ago, it would have been probably the balance was uh, in favor of the consulting. But now I, I think it's, it's starting to shift more towards product end. Uh, the consulting is still very good and we still do a lot of it. But again, giving a product or having a product um, you know, direction as well tends to um, skew our views a bit in terms of the, the customer um, because we have a bias towards our own products obviously versus uh, competitive ones. So it's changing a bit. We still can maintain a firewall between our consulting and our products but it becomes a little bit more difficult as we, uh, we tend to get out into the industry. So I'd say right now it's probably 50-50, you know, consulting and products but I think it's shifting higher towards the, the product end over the next two years. So you see yourself kind of returning to your, your roots? Kind of. It's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's going back uh, the way that we started. But it's a comfortable way to be because, I mean, that's, that's where we started. So we, we have the, the, uh, the history and we have the, the, the legacy to build upon as well. And that helps. And uh, how would you say the, the mining uh, sector and economy is doing nowadays? Is it on an upswing, you think? It's, it's always yeah. cyclical, but... It's always cyclical, but uh, it's been flat for the last couple of years. I mean, it's just, it's a harder sell these days, that, that I can tell you. But it was hard back uh, in our, you know, back in the Aquila days as well. You know, the products are not cheap, and uh, to, uh, you know, get, uh, you know, 100000 to half a million dollars out of a customer for a particular product is a hard, hard sell, unless the, the return on investment is there. And this is part of history, is that those, that, that business case becomes more clear and as more people move towards more automation in the operations it's an easier sell but I, i'd still say the industry is a little flat at this present time you know january 2017 and uh time will tell whether or not it improves this year so and um out of pec tech what would you say are your proudest because now you've i mean it's maybe very recent but the proudest uh, products that you've developed or worked well we've done we've done two the significance one is uh, the uh, uh, UGPS rapid mapper product which is uh, a solution that was based on state-of-the-art technology again I almost in the same vein as what we re realized with uh, GPS at the time enabling technologies in this case uh, the enabling technologies were lidar uh, devices in other words laser type uh, uh, scanning devices that give you three-dimensional uh, capabilities and uh, the formation of that product was based upon a need from a customer. Again, it was driven by needs of Barrick uh, Gold, who needed a better solution for underground positioning in the absence of, obviously, space-based satellites. And so UGPS came around as that, uh, as that result. But the fact was is it evolved beyond just a positioning system into one that provided three 3D mapping of an underground opening so that you can do again, it comes back to accuracy, it comes back to being able to understand your, where you are and what you're doing in three-dimensional space such that you can compare it to some plan that you have regarding how to get that ore out of the ground. And so UGPS has been a good product and uh, it was through a relationship again with a customer and we're quite proud of our, our development history with customers. Um, the second product would be the autonomous drilling product that we developed in collaboration with Tech, which was uh, the company that eventually bought Ford and Coal. So a lot of the legacy is of being the, the leader in technology development was reflected in the fact that Tech believed in us, given our past history with them over the past 20 years, 
and they also funded the development of this autonomous drilling product. And as a result of uh, that, we've been able to get credibility and footprint in the industry to go off and sell that to a number of other clients. And uh, this is why Caterpillar and I came back together, because it made sense for us to cooperate in that regard. So, And again, given the legacy that we had, we had a history with Cat. Um, so it made perfect sense for us to come together on this drill product again. And that's why we're, we're together today. What is that uh, drill product, the autonomous drill product? It's uh, mining? yeah no it's for open pit open it's for large blast hole drills I mean one thing in technology development you always have to realize is that what you know is what you know it's sometimes hard to go off into a a widely uh, different area than your own core competencies and experience and so we stayed the underground product that we did with UGPS was a was a different thing but it doesn't it takes some underground knowledge but it's really understanding the fusion between um, embedded platform, software, and sensing. That's really the key. That's what UGVS is. But the drill product is one that goes right back to our, our roots in terms of having pioneered high precision GPS and drills. And this builds upon that. It's an incremental process whereby you, you then go through the process of looking at the drilling cycle in terms of what it does as a machine and look for how you put it all together in an automated package so that the operator doesn't have to be anywhere near the machine. And so what this device does, it allows for a drill to continue to drill from a hole to hole because it moves from hole to hole and does a series of drilling, uh, removal of the drill steel, and then it essentially moves to the next hole. All that's automated. And so put in a, uh, a direction, put in a map of what you want it to do, it goes off and does it without the operator being involved. And so it's a semi-autonomous solution because there is some part of the process once it reaches the end of its, its uh, path that an operator has to get involved. And by nature of the definition of autonomous, autonomous means no human intervention. It's more of an automated system. But it's one that, uh, it's not a large market base currently from any supplier. And uh, given that CAT is a very large uh, uh, drill supplier in the world, there's the market that we can go after. And so this is why we, we've teamed with them. But it is, it's a very unique product in that sense. And one that customers are demanding. So again, timing is everything. So. Absolutely. Uh, looking forward, and this can be a, there's no limit to this question, it'd be more of a fun question, but where do you see the next big technology in mining? Or what is it? Well, if you read the, uh, read the press releases of all these companies that are doing digital strategies or digitalization strategies, it's all about uh, collecting data and doing analytics on that data. And uh, one thing I can say is that uh, there's lots of data that's been collected over time in mining from various you know, devices on all sorts of machines. But people have made very poor use of the data. They haven't really taken it together into a larger analytics package, big data, you know, the in internet of things, and uh, use that to make, you know, some decisions based upon the outcomes or the information that's that's from that. And I think that's going to be the, the trend. It's not so much there's any real um, uh, breakthrough type uh, solutions that are coming. I think the solution it's of combining everything is really the, the future. Okay. That's where things are going. So it's, again, making more effective use of data that you already have available. And if there's gaps in that, today's world, there's tons of sensors out there. There's a lot... Uh, uh, more of a choice in terms of how to, you know, get information off a particular component or a particular machine that, again, just rolls up into this larger big data type uh, concept. But I think it's having the facility to monitor, transmit, analyze, and make sense of that information in a shorter time period that's going to be the key game changer in mining. What do you think of, um, has that been around two 2000, Rob McEwen with uh, the Gold Corp Challenge, where he basically opened data, right? He yep. threw absolutely everything he had on uh, their Red Lake mine and yep. said, world, yep. make sense of this information. Well, again, that's, that's an interesting concept. I mean, it's giving a data set, and it, again, uh, hopefully the data set is correct, but what came out of it was uh, a, a cheap way to, to have a bunch of people go out and hack it and uh, see if there were any way, other different or different ways to slice and dice that information from which to make the, the right assessment. And I think it's happening. There's a number of uh, companies that are trying to do hackathons and trying to uh, 
inspire people to look at things a little bit differently because sometimes in one industry you have a mindset and you tend to approach it from the front versus from different directions and uh, I think getting different opinions or different viewpoints is very important and I think that is also happening uh, within within the standard information side of, uh, of mining as well. Um, this is where analytics comes in. There's different ways to sort of process the data and uh, as opposed to the old way. So, uh, so I think that's that's totally appropriate. And Barrick has done some things recently. As I said, they're throwing out some concepts and inviting technology people to come in and hack solutions. In other words, work with them in a in a more of a agile Scrum type manner to come up with uh, ideas that may be throwing, you know, ideas at the wall. But sometimes those ideas stick, and I, I'm all for it. I, I think we need to mix it up. Yeah, there's a shift to it. Seems to. Um a lot of these mining companies seem to be less secretive now, or at least mining seemed to used to be a very secretive, conservative yep. business. Correct. And now it's uh, at least some of them are trying the the opposite. There's more collaboration out there between parties, and I think people realize that holding intellectual property. And let's just look at it in the context of of technology. Um, everybody's heard quite a bit about uh, Rio Tinto and Mine of the Future type projects and they tried to retain all that IP internally. The problem with doing so is that you don't continue to develop it because it's so unique to the people that are there at the time. When those people leave, which Rio has laid off uh, tens of thousands of people, that IP all leaves with them and therefore the IP that you developed six years ago is totally obsolete because it's not evolved. So it, it allows you to get the lead on your competitor but I, I don't think there's lots of value in terms of just possessing it all and holding it in. So in many cases when we work with a customer, they give us all the IP. We have provisions with respect to the fact that they've given us or transferred the IP to us for a dollar or whatever the legal agreement is, that we will give them preferred pricing, we'll give them royalties on the product that we commercially exploit, but they also know that we'll continue to commercially exploit the product. So the IP is actually growing and they recognize they'll get the, the improvements that are uh, you know, coming about as a result of us going fully to market. So it's a much better relationship in the long run. And most mining companies want to stay mining. They're not a technology company. They use technology, but it's not their, it's not their core, you know, core expertise. Mm. So it's better to put it out and, and get it used in the industry to, to learn. Right. That's generally how it works. I'll, I'll keep going a bit on, the, on these kind of questions, get more into the uh, social questions. Yep. Uh, and this... Um, yeah, this next one's no wrong answer, um, but just um, yes, no, and, and why. Yep. Do you believe there's a disconnect between um, the mining industry, but we could also say more broadly the natural resource industry and the general public in Canada? Um, absolutely. There's a massive uh, disconnect. I, you know, when you tell people uh, that you're you're in mining and you know the mining in industry, and they they go mining. What's that? And they, then I just sort of hold up my smartphone and I say, you see this thing here? Without mining, you don't have this. And they go, wow, that's, that's really intense. And the answer is, that, again, most people don't really know. They, they don't know where you know, metals or minerals come from. And they really don't recognize how it contributes to, uh, to the country as a whole or to industry as a well. whole. And I, I think that is a, a big challenge. And... Um, most people see mining, they see the, the bad side of mining as well. You, it's a funny industry, but it's like any other industry. It, it, what makes the news more so is the, is the bad situations, the sensational stuff versus the successes. And you know, when you look at other uh, mining uh, countries of the world, um, and I've been to all of them, you realize how good Canada is at what it does in terms of extracting you know, ore from, uh, from the ground. Um, I don't think most Canadians know that. I, I think if they had to say, is, is Canada a mining jurisdiction, number one, most wouldn't know. Secondly, if, they, if you had to say, is mining a, a, a clean industry or a, a safe industry in Canada, they probably would say no, um, because they, they see nothing but uh, you know, the bad. You know, they talk about oil sands or people uh, slamming their oil sands or you know, uh, some, some other disaster elsewhere in, in Canada, and that becomes the focus point of the news. And it tends to condition people's mindsets. So, so I, I'd, I'd say that, um, yeah, there is a disconnect, big time. So. Yeah. And do you think the, because um, it, it is true that it seems that the media 
as for anything, they'll go with what's sexier and yeah. right? um, usually, which is more negative. Uh, but do you think the industry is also doing enough um, to include um, and help the people understand what, what they truly do? I, I think there's lots of groups that are trying to do things. I mean, I, I can remember back to the Mining Association of BC. This is uh, back in the uh, early 90s, and uh, there was a particular gentleman there that uh, you know was trying to reach out to the universities and high schools and colleges to sort of dispel all the miscon misconceptions of uh, mining and trying to profile them in a much different way. And um, yeah, it was a struggle back then. But, and I, I'm sure that uh, other groups have seen the same thing. I mean, you can keep talking about it uh, and promoting it, but it, you know, again, people that are out in the communities in the mining areas recognize the value. People in cities um, don't realize it because it's not, it's not around them. They don't see it. They don't uh, experience it. Uh, their, their mother or father doesn't get up every day and go to a mine. Um, but, uh, so there's a disconnect between urban centers and you know, out, uh, out in the regions, for sure. And I think that's how to, how to bridge that gap. It's a tough one. It's very tough. Uh, next question is a, it's an earful, but again, no wrong answer. In your opinion, are there any events, people, inventions, contributions, disasters, anything really that must be mentioned when talking about the history of the natural resources in Canada? Well, there's always lessons learned. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's a tremendous um, line of uh, different events that have occurred that from which uh, you hopefully you recover from, but you also learn from, you know, tailings, you know, pond failures and things like that, which we, we recently had at, uh, in British Columbia. Uh, you'd think that would be over in this day and age, but it's not. Um, there's, a, there's a number of different things like that. But I, I, look, I think it's uh, some of those disasters have, uh, certainly from a Canadian perspective, has ha have happened less and less. Um, you know, the footprint upon the earth or the footprint of mining in general is um, there's only a certain reduction you can do. I mean, an open pit's an open pit. But um, I, I think uh, can Canadians have been looking for new technologies for extracting ore. Um, and I'm certainly working with a lot of them now that are looking to be much more sensitive and being able to work in areas like Nunavut, you know, uh, where, you know, the environmental footprint is... Uh, uh, needs to be, uh, you know, minimalized by, by every degree. Plus, you're dealing in a harsh environment in general and indigenous people around. Um, so, uh, Canadians are inspired by that uh, to try to do things differently. And I think they certainly are very conscious of, you know, past issues and problems in the, in the mining industry in general in Canada that they're building on. And so they look to the future to see how they can avoid doing those things again, or uh, again uh, doing things differently. And I think that's, those are lessons that every mining engineer, at least I know in Canada, is conscious of. So, uh, but any one instance, hard to say. You know, there's, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the movie by the NFB or something called The Whole Story. You know, it's uh, something to take a look at. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting. What's that one about? Uh, it's about mining in, in Canada, uh, Sudbury and uh, some of the other gold mining areas of Canada. So it's, it's, again, it's got a certain perspective on it, but it also doesn't promote some of the, uh, the value of it. If you, if you suddenly said, um, we're not going to do any mining, then what would the society look like here in Canada if we didn't have minerals to rely on? Yeah, we can recycle a lot, but you still need to replenish the, uh, the inventories with, uh, with new minerals, especially if we have such demands uh, from uh, society on you know, consumer-driven products. So it's, uh, again, you can always see things in, in different light. And uh, the whole story gives you sort of a one-sided one look at things. But, you know, so it's, it's those sorts of things that people tend to look at. And uh, today's world, I mean, we talk about false news, you know, on the, through uh, social media. I mean, hard to, uh, hard to ignore. You know, again, people are influenced heavily by what they read, uh, whether it's from a reliable source or not. And there's a lot of that online. You know, so. Well, Mining Watch is another one. Mining Watch tends to be somewhat, uh, you know, focused on the the negative versus the positive, and they're a very they're a very aggressive group, and that's fine. I mean, you always need a really need, some, yeah. you need a balance in in anything, and it's always good to ask the hard questions, and hopefully you get the right answers. And I, I 
But again, it does tend to skew people's view of, viewpoint. If you don't want to read the other side of the story, you can always read, you know, the other extreme, and uh, that tends to become, you know, what you believe in. So that's mine. Yeah. Well, um, a few perspective questions here. Looking back at your career, and this is usually what people find the toughest. This question is. What has been the most challenging or difficult, uh, either project or part of your career? Well, I've had some challenging pro projects. I've had some challenging products. I've had some challenging clients. I've had uh, some technical hurdles that we've had to overcome. Um, all of the above, but it's part of the growth of a company. It's by um, having some failures in your career and having some failures as part of being a product developer that makes you stronger the next time around. Um, uh, mining is a, it's a, uh, an interesting industry in that it's, it's everywhere. And so some of the places you have to go and do work in are in the middle of nowhere. And uh, language can be a barrier, cultural differences can be a barrier, not only with the language, but also with just the environment and the way that the people work. Um, all of those things have been hurdles to us in the past. I mean, we've done work as far away as, uh, you know, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and, uh, you know, again, um, those are in isolated areas, but we've done work as well in Latin America and some places that are extremely isolated as well. And they all carry with it certain, certain challenges. So, uh, again, dealing with clients sometimes and making sure that your ex their expectations are calibrated with yours and you deliver the right product, it, uh, it, there's, there's been a few of those in my time. But nothing that hasn't uh, allowed us to continue, it hasn't uh, sunk the company or, you know, we just use those as uh, lessons learned and we deal with it and engineer a solution around it and deal with the customer in the right manner, you know, commercially and openly. Uh, the, the best way to get through these things in mining, and I, I can tell you, is it's better to tell them the bad news and be honest about it than to, uh, you know, to lie and, uh, or, or, you know, diminish the, uh, the issues. Uh, best thing is to come out straight and just tell them. So, full transparency. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, what's the next one I wanted to ask you? Um, I'll ask you one about uh, women in mining. Yep. Um, throughout your career, and you've done, like I said, you've traveled yep. a lot. Uh, you've worked for different companies, with different companies, uh, different clients. How uh, present or absent? Have women been throughout your career, and has that changed? And if so, how so? Very few in the beginning, and I started my career in mining in about '89. Um, but were there, uh, you know, women that came into uh, um, into the industry after that point in time? And I'd say slowly. I mean, it's still a it's still a fairly man, you know, man dominated industry. There's no doubt about it. It's a male dominated industry, and it really comes back to. Um, you know, the fact that this is an industry that's not viewed uh, as being very innovative. It's not viewed as uh, being very conducive to, uh, to a young woman that wants to get into a, a suitable career. Um, it doesn't appeal to people that have been growing up in urban environments to go to the remote. No, it's the exception. There are some that, that prefer that. But uh, it, it's been tough. It's not easy for women, as I said, given the, the domination by, by males. Um, but I've seen it change, and I, some of the people that I deal with today in consulting projects that I have, um, those interfaces are women, and they're women that have a long career in, in mining, demonstrated a, a great capacity for, for knowledge of uh, mining, and uh, you know have been able to, to fight through the you know the uh, you know the hurdles that they faced, and uh, they're now in fairly senior positions. And you can see it right across the industry. I mean, uh, uh, Barrick, uh, their VP Innovation and Strategy, a woman named Michelle Ash is there now. She was a Rio Tinto person. I deal with uh, another uh, woman at uh, Agnico Eagle, Dominique Baudry. She's the manager of innovation, so she's come a long way. And you know, basically, they've uh, they've gotten to their positions because they they have good uh, good knowledge and uh, they're capable people. So, but it is still. You know, in in the uh, the minority, you know, um, it is it's just not a, t a a an easy environment for them sometimes. So, yeah, whether it whether it's um, wanted or not, it's not necessarily the most appealing thing if uh, if it's all men, for example. Right? 
Well, it is. I, 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 I think, but you know, it, it, it again, it comes back to the challenges of modern modern life. I mean, um, you know, um, if you're going to have a family, and where do you want to raise them, and uh, what do you want to do? You know, raising them out in small towns is not all that easy either. It's it's challenging. It's uh, limited in terms of services, in terms of a variety of different things. So most people want to give you know the best to their family. So after a period of time, after you graduate, uh, again, do a lot of women come back to the urban centers and looking for jobs mainly in big cities? And I don't know. It's it, it, I think it's the same with some of the the young male graduates that come out. So I don't I don't think it's it's just a question of men or women it's a question of just the mentality sometimes of the people that are graduating what do they want from life uh, do they really want to go and sacrifice in their view uh, four to ten years out in the, the middle of nowhere and the answer is I'd say the vast majority probably don't they, they, they want to quickly rise uh, up in the ranks and uh, you know uh, settle down in a, in a comfortable job in an urban environment in most cases I mean we we've seen the change and I've seen the change within the hiring of people, uh, just given that that change in mentality, um, so it's just the way the nature of the the current generation, to some extent. So I, I, again, I don't think it's a man or man woman thing. It's more the, the way that uh, particular mindset is these days. So, um, would you consider to have one or many mentors through your career? Well, one key one is Malcolm Scoble. I mean, uh, Malcolm would be my my biggest mentor. He, uh, you know, again, uh, being being at McGill in a master's program in geotech engineering, and then taking Malcolm's course, it was one of my inspirations for getting into mining. I just thought it was very cool. Uh, it was a great industry in the sense that there were so many different facets to it. It didn't seem to be, you know, focused on any one particular area. It seems to be very broad. And I saw the opportunities of being there, and Malcolm was the one that inspired me. He encourages, encouraged me to get into the the industry. He dragged me across into a master's. Didn't drag me across, but inspired me to come across to a master's uh, with him at Miguel as uh, my uh, thesis advisor. And uh, he gave me all the uh, the leeway to do what I wanted, which was good because I I, I I'm not one to be uh, overly managed. I kind of like my freedom. And I kind of like to do my own thing. And Malcolm gave me that latitude. And it's uh, for that reason I probably uh, was able to complete my master's and PhD in a reasonably quick time, um, you know, four years total, and um, it was uh, it was well worth it. You know, so Malcolm would be the key instigator of uh, a lot of what I I uh, you know did and uh, and what I became. I learned a lot from Malcolm. So, so. I'll ask you a few last questions. Yep. What are you proudest of? Um, throughout your professional life? Oh, probably Aquila Mining Systems was a proud, uh, you know, proud moment. And uh, in fact, I'm, uh, I'm flying to Denver uh, the 19th of, uh, 19th or 20th of February because I've actually been inducted into the Technology Hall of Fame through the uh, uh, International uh, Mining Journal. Um, and it's really for that legacy for Aquila. And Aquila was a was a pioneer in many ways, and I, I look at it and I look back and I said, how do how did we do it? But it was just a question of being in the right place at the right time with uh, with the right ideas and the right people. And it wasn't certainly only me; it was uh, the group of people that we had that were able to you know persevere and work through some challenging times to uh, to uh, deliver some interesting products. So I'd say Aquila was probably it because it's that uh, set me up for my next phase of of career, which was where I am today, uh, with that legacy in mind, it was, or behind me, it was an easy thing to build upon because auto automatically you can go to people and make the connection. And say, well, we're we were Aquila Mining Systems, and they go instant recognition, so they know you've done it before. You could probably do it again. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd, I'd say that was it. But also for the training of of people, I mean, if we look at the roots of people that we train through Aquila, and also through uh, through Pectech. There's been a number of um, highly qualified people that have come through the, the organization, have gone off to do wonderful things with other companies. So we actually trained a lot of interesting people. And uh, those people were, uh, you know, have gone on to contribute quite a bit to other companies. So um, including within Caterpillar and Trimble and other large companies like that. So that's also the, the training aspect. And you know, again, um, 
development of people is, is also a big thing that I'm proud of. And last question, if you're speaking to a student, someone much younger, for example, uh, what would be the one life lesson or piece of advice you would give them looking forward if they're thinking of maybe going into mining or something like that? Uh, mining, mining is a great, uh, a great career, and it's, to be honest with you, it's what you make of it. Uh, there's no uh, instruction manual uh, when you come out of mining. You can walk into a whole bunch of different things. It really depends on you know, what you want to do. Uh, people can either feed you what you're going to do or you can you know, uh, define for yourself what you want to do. And it, again, it depends on the company you're getting into. But there's always a mentor like Malcolm around the, around the rim that will uh, allow you to have the latitude to think outside the box. And I think the key is, is don't think you know, too close uh, to uh, what your job description is. Try to see opportunities and go after them. And uh, one thing that is always recognized in mining is, uh, is somebody that goes uh, the extra mile, somebody that takes the initiative on its own on their own uh, to go off on a certain tangent and take responsibility for, for a project. And I think that's the interesting thing about mining, which is not as structured as other industries, certainly not as other engineering disciplines where it's very well defined. Because it is an engineering thing in which you're, you know, there's a liability associated with it. Mining has liability and you, you have some constraints, but in the world of technology and mining, doors, doors open. Massive amounts of opportunities, especially these days. Um, this, you know, the next five to ten years in mining is going to be very exciting, especially with respect to the, the application of technologies that have been proven in other industries coming into mining. There's going to be more and more of that. So, this is this is a great opportunity to be there, and hopefully the mining companies recognize it. So, that they they need to continue to recruit from universities so and support them. That would be the uh, you know the biggest. Uh, you know, challenge that I see coming up is that connection that industry actually hires students, which when industry is down, they don't hire students, right. which is a problem. So, To a, a brighter future. Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that's fine. I think, uh, look, it's been, a, it's been a great run, been a great career. I'm not done yet. I've got another five to ten years to go and, you know, watch this space. There'll be more... Uh, more coming out of us in due course, so we're we're not uh, done innovating uh, by any means. Uh, we're we're going to continue to push the envelope, and we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll be here, uh, you know, doing that for the next many years. So, well, thank you. Thank you.